And those were our Hollywood guests commenting on our film this evening, The Court Jester, and its star, Danny Kaye. We continue now in our studio by introducing a very special guest, well qualified to explore our theme on this occasion, funny man, Danny Kaye. In fact, he is more than well qualified because he has actually lived the persona, at least on stage he has, of Mr. Kaye. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Kurt McMahon, alias Danny Kaye. But first, here he is in a clip from his stage show, Shaking Like a Leaf. I wouldn't want you to get the wrong impression of me. I was born in the Bronx, and my parents were Russian immigrants from the Ukraine. Maybe that Russian connection is why this song was written for me. So without the least excuse, or the slightest provocation, may I fondly introduce for your mental delectation the names that always give me brain concussion, the names of those composers known as Russian. There's Malachewski, Rubinstein, Arensky, and Tchaikovsky, Sapelnikov, Dmitriev, Cherenkov, and Krizhanovsky, Godowsky, Aki, Buchov, Mani, Yusko, Aki, Menko, Solovia, Prokovia, Tiemkin, Korotenko, there's Glinko, Winkler, Botniansky, Radakov, Lienski, there's Metin, Balakira, Solotov, Ekotinsky, and Sokolov, and Kopolov, Tukowski, and Konovsky, and Shostakov, and Borodin, Lied, and Novakovsky, there's Lidanov, and Karganov, Mikhailovich, Penchenko, and Dargominsky, Chermachevsky, Adam, Bazilenko, Sterinsky, Rimsky, Kosakov, Mososki, and Gorchanov, and Glazanov, and Music, we come in the country, Kana, Stavinsky, and Gatana, Rushivsky, and Rakmana. I really have to stop the subject, has been done the first time. Stavinsky, Gatana, Rushivsky, Rakmana. I really have to stop because you're all about the Kana. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Kirk McMahon. Kirk, it's an honor to have you in our studio. Well, thank you for inviting me. That was some routine. Oh, yeah, it was one of the first routines I ever learned, and it, it's very difficult to do. Well, give us the statistics on how in blazes you ever mastered it. Uh, well, I mean, you know, 52 Russian composers in 38 seconds, it's just a matter of having a very quick tongue to begin with and then lots and lots of repetition. I had a, a, a lady come to a show we did in Markham and, and she uh, came right up to me and she said, well, you know, you do all these tongue twisting numbers, you do this Tchaikovsky number, we'll try unique New York, 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 and which of course is very, very difficult to do, but, you know, I have a talent for that kind of thing. So, but Tchaikovsky was, took weeks. Weeks? Weeks. That's nightly, daily. I mean, yes. That's really oh, yeah. Yeah. Case In order to be able to do them so that you can hear them clearly and understand them as, as the Russian composers that they really are. May, may I uh, pause for a moment and uh, tell our viewers just, I was shocked when I met you. I mean, I've seen the clip, but to meet you in the flesh, the likeness, the K is scary. Yeah, it's really Scary. Quite... I'm frightened. I'm shaking. Yeah, in 82, I, I had no idea there was any resemblance there at all. And in 82, I came to Toronto and, and I had a new resume photo done up and a secretary said to me, you look a lot like Danny Kaye, has anyone ever told you that? And from that moment on until now, the resemblance seems to get more and more uncanny. And it's, it's, it's spooky, but it's been, a wonderful, it's been a wonderful likeness to have. Not to get too personal, but your suit reminds me of... Yeah, this is actually of one of... It is. It is one of Danny Kaye's suit, uh, suits from uh, White Christmas. Uh, that he wore during the dance routine with Vera Ellen. And uh, I was very lucky to acquire it during an auction of, of uh, studio material uh, down in L.A. So, um, so I actually wear this suit in the show, and uh, it gets that little extra edge to the show that is just wonderful for the actor. Before we get back to Shaking Like a Leaf, um, would you tell us a little bit, tell our viewers a little bit, tell me a little bit about your birth, your Canadian background, something to fill in something there for Sure. Um, well, I was born in Oshawa. Uh, my family is from Kinley, Saskatchewan. And the McMahons have been in Canada for six generations. And uh, so, you know, we're, we've, we've been here a long time. Uh, uh, what else would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is. You went to school in? I uh, went to school in Oshawa. Um, then I went down to the Niagara Peninsula to go to university. And that's where I studied theater. That's what I was going to get to next, and might as well start there. Your theatrical experience. What went behind what we're seeing here ah, tonight? What well, went behind? Well, um, after I finished uh, my three years in university in the theater department, I got hired at Shaw Festival, 
and I spent two seasons there. Oh. And then I went on tour. Doing what? What kind of roles? Oh, um, you know, doing uh, various different things. Uh, Captain Breastbone's Conversion, you know, I was a, a character in, in that particular oh, show. Lots of variety um, then. Lots yeah. of variety. Um, you know, it was an apprentice program, so you were constantly different characters in the crowd or, or a, a small part, etc. But I got to work with greats like Tony Van Bridge and Eric House and Sandy Webster, which was good for me being a, you know, a young 21-year-old new actor that that you know really admired these people so I got to work with them and they would chat to me about you know what do you want to do well then maybe you should try this or try that and then I got a chance to tour with a, a company that was based in St. Catharines called Carousel Players and they're a participation children's theater group um, they do what's called theater and education which is from England and you go right into the schools and you you put together shows that are, are meant to be educational for K to three four to six grade seven and eights mm -hmm. And I toured with them all across Ontario for three years. And then I moved to Toronto in 82 and began doing the, the audition circuit and uh, worked for various companies here in, in Toronto. Tell us how you discovered Danny Kay. Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, in 82 when I came, I had a new resume photo done up and uh, people began to mention about the resemblance to Kay. And at that particular time, I had the chance to work for a company called Air One Theatre in Canada. And in 84, um, we went to uh, the Edinburgh Festival to do Wind in the Willows. And I played Ratty. <laughs> and uh, it was a full mass show, and it was the 75th anniversary of, of Kenneth Graham's birthday. And, and so the show was very successful. And I had this very old lady come up to me during one of the shows afterwards and, and say, you know, I saw Danny Kaye at the London Palladium in 1948, and he was wonderful and you look so much like him, you should do a show about Danny Kaye. So when I went to London, uh, because this had been mentioned to me hundreds of times by now, and it was really beginning to bother me, and I went into London, England, and I went to the Palladium, and they have an archives there, and I began to look into what Kay really did, and I discovered this stage show that he had done for 20 years, and I was looking for the one thing I hadn't done yet, which was, which was a one-man vehicle, and uh, I went back to Toronto, that fall and I began to look at the films that he did and I began to see the resemblance and I began to see that his performance style was similar to mine and so in June of 85 I approached some professionals in New York and Canada here vocally and choreography wise and dance etc and said this is what he does this is what I can do how do I get to there because this is what I want to do I want to do it, this show that he did and they said well a couple of years of full-time training and uh, you'll be there so in June, I quit uh, performing, and I started training full-time to do the K persona. Ah. It's, it's, it is an obsession, though, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the, the fact that I'm the same height and the shoe size and, and the waist and the suit size and all of these things just kind of compound themselves over the couple of years that we were training that I drove people totally nuts. <laughs> I really did. I mean, everything suddenly was a, an affirmation of, yeah, oh, I should be yeah. doing K because, you know, my ribs got broken during the same show that he did at the London Palladium and, you know, and oh, all that kind weird. of stuff. So. I'm just hungry, and I know our viewers are out there for another clip from Shaking Like a Leaf, so we're going to go to that now. And if my memory serves me, it's the vessel with a pestle, which I swear, I swear, is just one of the greatest things I think you've ever, ever done. There's the pellet with the poison. In the vessel with the pestle, don't you see? The pellet with the poison's in the vessel with the pestle. The chalice from the palace is the brew that is true. <laughs> the pellet with the poison's in the vessel with the pestle. The chalice from the palace is the brew that is true. Good man. Just remember that. Okay. okay. The pellet with the poison's in the vessel with the pestle. And the... No, no, no. The vessel with the pestle has the pellet with the fella. And the fella with the poison's in the... No, no. The fella with the poison's in the vessel with the pestle. No, 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 no. The, the pellet with the poison's in the vessel with the pestle, the chalice from the palace is the brew that is true. Uh, right? Right, but there's been a change. <laughs> they broke the chalice from the palace. They broke the chalice from the palace? And replaced it with a flagon. A flag? With the figure of a dragon. A flagon with a dragon? Right. But did you put the pellet with the poison in the vessel with the pestle? No, the pellet with the poison's in the flagon with the dragon. The vessel with the pestle has the brew that is true. It's easy to remember, just say it. The pellet with the poisons in the uh, flagon with the dragon, and the vessel with the pestle has the brew that is true. Okay. Good man. Just remember that, and you might live. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, the, the pellet with the poisons in the dragon with the flagon, and the flagon, no, the fellow with the dragon. No, the dragon in the flagon is the fellow with the poison. No, no, the fellow. 
Just remember that. <laughs> it's easy. Just say it. You know. Oh, that's right. But what can I say? That's incredible. It always gets a tremendous response when we do that in the show. From the opening two words, you know, the audience just does this gasp. Oh, they're going to do it. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's just a wonderful little piece to do. I think it's probably one of the most famous, well-known. Oh. I mean, it's like uh, who's on first, what's on second. I mean, it's... Oh, this, this picture is full of miracles. Would you give us an assessment now? You're, you're a film critic here of The Court Jester. Well, it certainly was the first film that Danny Kaye and Sylvia Fine produced in, in total and financed themselves, uh, their Dina Productions. And uh, they wanted to have better control over, over what Kay did. Kay had never really found his niche. He had never been in a film that, that really showed his talents to, to the nth degree. And they felt that they could do it better themselves. And they had acquired enough wealth, I guess, by then, and enough context to be able to do it. And so I think, generally, it's, it's one of the finest films that, that he ever did, because it, it gives him the vehicle in which to sh display his talent. And it also gives him a story for once, instead of having all these golden girls suddenly show up and dance around and there's no story there at all, and songs come out of nowhere. So it's, and it's, it's a very lavish production. I mean, this film cost $4 million, and it made $12 million, and uh, it made a lot of money for Kay. So they were able to go on and, and do other films. Um, but uh, it's, it's truly, I think, uh, one of the finest films. I mean, the whole, the whole business throughout the whole film, I mean, it's, it's almost perfect. It's, it's tremendous. Just like I said earlier, before our interview, that uh, to our viewers out there, that it's, uh, boy, it's uh, it's far more entertaining in many, many ways than many of the adventure epics that it seeks to a parody. Yes. I mean, it really is lavish, and it's wonderful yeah. entertainment. Yeah, Sylvia Fine had this really cutting humor, and, and she, I think, just went totally nuts with the court jester to just make fun <laughs> of all of those films that we've been watching for so yeah. many years. Your favorite K movies and why? Some of your favorite, Fear for or whatever. Well, Knock on Wood is, is, is one of my big favorites, and it, and it was Kay's favorite film, too, oh, as well. Oh, now tell me about that. Um, well, Knock on Wood, you know, was this wonderful kind of spy premise, and there's just a, a, a whole series of routines in there that are really valuable for me in terms of a performer. Yeah. Um, it's during a time in Kay's life when, when the, the energy and, and, and the, the funniness and the facial expressions were, were all there, and it was kind of right at the, the height of his career. Um, and uh, there's... Again, there's, there's a couple of uh, uh, things in the film that we do in the show that are just stand out and have such a big reaction that um, I, it's, it's my favorite film uh, from that point of view. Uh, another film that I like so much is Wonder Man, uh, which was the second film he made. And the reason I like Wonder Man so much was, is because it was the first film I saw after everyone kept saying, you look a lot like Danny Kaye. And this came on television. And I took a look, and there's a, a scene in the nightclub. He, he does a song um, called Ochichorinya. And it was then I discovered that the resemblance was absolutely uncanny, and that there were moments when it looked as if it was me up there and not Kay. Yeah. And that's what basically motivated me to do what I am doing now. That's deliciously scary, though, isn't it? Certainly I mean, is. Certainly is, yeah. yeah. Do you ever forget who you are? Well, actors have these little tricks, you know, to make sure that you don't kind of mix things up. And especially when you're going to get this obsessed about something and spend so many years working on a character like this and performing hundreds of shows, uh, you try to keep them separate. So when I'm like this, I'm Kay. And when I'm Kirk, I wear some glasses. I dress quite differently. And, uh, and, and I try to keep it apart because near the opening in 88 here in Toronto, I was so meshed together that the... the there wasn't much oh. to distinguish between me or Kay, and it became a bit of a hassle problem for the people around me. So, Some career highlights you might want to comment on, sir, uh, of Kay uh, on, on TV, on Broadway? Other career um, highlights? Yeah. He did for four years a, an Emmy Award winning show called The Danny Kay Show. Uh, it's an interesting time for him because he decided to not do any more of that get get kittle stuff. And so all of the, uh, the producers and the writers were instructed to, to write songs for him that, that were quite different. And um, the show was famous for, for its format, its variety format. It was famous for the types of people that it brought on, Lucille Ball, and the kinds of routines that were done. Um, also, it was the first hint of uh, Kay's perfectionism in terms of turning a little, a little sour. There's a famous story in... in, in the that, title of that again, that show? The Danny Kay Show. The Danny Kay Show yeah. itself, that's what it's and uh, there was a young girl at the end of every show, he would sit down on a stool and they would have a little kind of fireside yeah. chat. And the story goes that she 
was upstaging him or he felt that she was upstaging him and so he had her fired. And that is supposed to be an example of, of how uh, Kay had become uh, a little more insecure, a little more bitter about uh, his, his career and he was very exacting, very, very hard to work with. Uh, but from what I've read, that, that's not how it went. But so Now, um, other things. Uh, uh, television, and you mentioned something else. Or Broadway. Either. The Broadway. Yeah. Well, you know, he did this uh, Broadway show in 72 called Two by Two. Oh, about Noah. About Noah, uh, Noah's Ark, that's right. And uh, Kay made that very famous because the, the script apparently wasn't very well liked, and the score was, was very lovely, but it was kind of a mediocre show from the point of view of the critics. And Kay, being in the title role, um, ended up having a situation where he broke his leg. Oh, boy. And um, they discovered the show couldn't go on without Kay. So he decided to come on with a wheelchair and do the show with a wheelchair. And then later on, when he got out of the wheelchair, he had crutches. But the show changed from that point on because Kay began to take control in terms of he started doing mugging and making reference to the fact that he was in a wheelchair. And he began to do a lot of Kay stuff so that a lot of the characters in the show began to call it the Danny Kay show and not <laughs> two by two um, and because he, he was so... Uh, predominant and, and, and controlling in that particular Broadway show. However, from the producer's point of view, it was uh, a godsend because it ran for a year and it made the money and, uh, and the show would have normally have closed after about 50 or 60 oh, performances. Right. The only modern uh, uh, comedian that I, I can think of with that kind of maniacal obsession is Robin Williams. Yes. He, he, he can go on and on and on and on. And I love it. Everything he does, as I would have loved Kay with his wheelchair, I'm sure. Because yeah, I imagine the two would have got along really yeah. well. <laughs> upstaging, <laughs> upstaging one another. Exactly. Sylvia Fine. I never met her, but I hear a lot about her. Oh, yes. Yes. You know, there's a story about Sylvia Fine. Apparently in the 40s, Hollywood would make up stories to personify what, it, what the person was like. And the story goes about Sylvia Fine that uh, Sylvia Fine called the studio one time when he was doing The Court Jester. And one of the, the technicians answered the phone, and she said, Hello, this is Sylvia Fine. You know, may I speak to so-and-so? And there was silence on the phone. She said, Hello, 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 this is Sylvia Fine. What, what's the matter? And the technician said, I was just bowing. Oh, oh, that's marvelous. So oh, she that's was, marvelous. She was, she always was for Kay, his mentor. She wrote, of course, uh, uh, 200 of his specialty songs for movies and, and film stage. and stage work. Um, she was very exacting, she was very demanding, and we all have to remember that she was a, an aggressive, exorbitantly talented woman during a time uh, when it wasn't really that accepted. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, being aggressive like she did and looking out for her husband's career, she wasn't well liked. But she made it happen, and she made Kay look good, and that's what you know, right. ended that's up being important. Shaking Like a Leaf, back to Shaking Like a Leaf, the title. How did you get the title and well, its significance, meaning, and so it, on? It is very significant. Um, Kay first performed at the Palladium, the London Palladium, in 1948. And uh, the f opening night, when the MC came out and introduced, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you, know, you all to welcome this American entertainer, Mr. Danny Kay. And they all clapped, and the 6,000 people in the audience clapped, and nobody came out. And Kay was off on the OP side, just stage fright. The first time in his entire life, he was just stuck there and he couldn't move. So they introduced him again and everyone clapped and he didn't come out. And the stage manager saw what happened and he literally gave Kay a boot. And Kay stumbled out onto the stage and once he was out in the lights, there wasn't much he could do. So he walked up to the microphone and he went, <laughs> I'm shaking like a leaf, honestly. And it just broke the ice and it made people realize that this was going to be okay. And he started into his first number, Minnie the Moocher. Cab Calloway's old signature yeah. tune, and uh, the rest is pretty well history. I mean, he was the, the biggest single success the Palladium has ever seen for five years running, and that launched his entire uh, stage career. You described the show. We've seen a clip or so. Would you describe it and some of the people connected with it, etc.? Yes. Well, Shaken Like a Leaf is a, a look at Kay's life from about 1942 to about 1956, and um, it tells about Kay's life basically through song, about 20 songs, and scenes that connect the songs. So we get to see a little bit of, of Kay's personal life, his interaction with Sylvia Fine and some of the people that he worked with. You get to see how a particular song 
was created in, in a, in, in, during that particular time. The song itself leads to a, a, a conflict that happened in 1947. Uh, Kay and Sylvia Fine separated very, very briefly over this whole Lennon Palladium gig, and, and that's dealt with. So there's, there's a, a whole collection of, of uh, kind of, you know, um, a bit of angst, I guess, in the show, yeah. you would call it. But uh, primarily it's musical. And uh, again, it, it follows the music from, from the early times, uh, from Anatola Paris, which was the very first tune that Sylvia Fine ever wrote for Danny Kaye in the Catskill Mountains in the Boar Circuit. Oh, yes. Uh, to the f most famous routines you would see in, in, in his films. And How long running is your show now? I mean, it, it runs 90 minutes, and it's been running since September of 1988. We've been on the road for three years now. That's it? Yeah. That's not bad. Congratulations. Yeah. Still Thank going you. hot and strong. Yes, 255 performances. Oh, boy, that's lovely. Where have you toured now? Well, we just finished completing our tour in Ontario, and uh, we're whereabouts? I'm I love this oh, province so much. Well, <laughs> everything from Atacokan to Blind River to you know, large thousand-seat houses at in Ottawa, um, pretty well. Well, about a hundred, a hundred cities or towns all through in this Ontario. gorgeous province. Yeah, oh. and it's wonderful. We're going to be touring. Uh, your province, uh, British Columbia, yeah, my, my, and my, my, my new one. My new That's one. right. Yeah. And uh, actually, I'm leaving on Wednesday to go down to Boston and begin the uh, U.S. tour. We're doing the entire Eastern Seaboard. Oh, that's that's for me. You'll have to get in touch with me when you get out there, please. Oh yeah. We'll work that out because I want to see it. And uh, you know, upcoming upcoming plans, sir. The future now. Well, the U.S. tour, of course, is very important to us because uh, it's it's Kay's home country, and he's most well loved and best loved there. Um, the big plan on the horizon, there are two things actually. Uh, I was approached by the London Symphony Orchestra and the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony Orchestra to do what's called an evening with Danny Kay. And what we're going to be doing is 30 minutes, the conductor will come out and do a Pops concert. And for 30 minutes, I'll come out as the young Kay and with full orchestra do the Kay material. And then for 30 minutes, I'll come out in full dress tails, white hair as the old Kay, and conduct comically as Kay used to conduct. Oh, that's going to be something. And uh, we're going to be opening uh, at the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony Orchestra with that, and then four other orchestras in, in Canada are going to be picking the thing up. And the other big thing is to get back to the London Palladium and to do a run there uh, for longer than one night. Yeah, that would seem to be very, very important. Yes, yes and it is. And is, it, is that difficult? I mean, the prestige that you've garnered unto yourself and your troupe. Well, it's in negotiations. They're very interested about it, and it's just a matter of, of, of when and what time and timing, you know. The London Palladium is a very different space now. It's a, it's a touring house, and they don't do their own in-house stuff, and, uh, and so it's just a matter of timing. But um, uh, uh, the owner of the Palladium is the, the man who saw the show and invited me to the Palladium back in 88 to do the show there. So uh, we've got uh, good backing and good interest in terms, of, in terms of making it happen. So we're excited about it. Since I haven't seen your show as of yet, I've seen the clips, of course, but not, not the show. How many are in the cast? Who's, 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 all, who's all in it with you? Well, it's done as, as Kay originally did it, just uh, before, well, later on in, in Kay's career after the Palladium, he was able to do tour with a full orchestra. But nowadays, you can't, you can't do that. But earlier on in his career, he had Sammy Prager, who was his accompanist. And so the show is, is done in that way. Bare stage, coat rack, chair, grand piano, Sammy on the piano, and me. And then we have a lighting designer and a technician that run the show for us. Well, what about? But but do you do mo do you do the other parts then? Yeah. And so this is what I mean. You are playing not only K play. You're playing K playing other people then. That's right. Oh, that That's is right. intriguing. Yeah. That's another whole dimension to it all. It makes it really interesting. Yeah, I was wondering. There there there, there was a show on by, on Billy Bishop. You know the. Oh yes. Which was that? And, and it was Billy and the and the the pianist. That's wasn't That's right. It? Very so, similar. So so this is. There's a lot of interaction between the accompanist yeah. and I. Yeah. Now, after you've been running, I'd like to know this, say, you have three years, you've told us, you're in your fourth year now. And that, do you still have rehearsals, or are the shows the rehearsals, or what? No, the show is changing constantly. See, every, every show we go to, we meet at least one person who saw Kay perform live, and she tells us something new we didn't know, either a particular way he performed a song or about a song we didn't know about. And so about every six months, we go into rehearsal, and we revamp the show because of what we've learned from the show. And uh, we just finished a major, major two-week uh, uh, rehearsal uh, this past spring. And uh, we're going to be doing rehearsal. another one for the U.S. Listen to the man. After all that, oh, yeah. a major two-week yeah, It rehearsal. has to keep it fresh. has to keep it live. You have yeah. to keep the energy up. can never let show business stand still. No. It'll no. atrophy, won't it? It will exactly. do something. And exactly. Become inertia-ridden. He's too important and too exciting to do to make it 
to, to let it kind of get boring. Kirk McMahon, I want to thank you so much, and all the viewers are. It's a delight meeting you and sharing those clips. And I'm still hungry for another clip. Do you know that? <laughs> so I want to thank you, Kirk. And thank I wanna, you. But I want to go out in another clip. And an uh, ugly duckling seems to uh, rear its head. And, uh, well, viewers, you take over from here. There once was an ugly duckling with feathers all stubby and brown. And the other birds, in so many words, said, Get out of town. Get out. Get out. Get out of town. And he went with a quack and a waddle and a quack and a flurry of eider down. That poor little ugly duckling went wandering far and near. But at every place they said to his face, now get out of here. Get out. Get out. Get out of here. And he went with a quack and a one and a quack and a very unhappy tear. <laughs> <laughs>